Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Killer Cross-Examination. I'm your host, Neil Rockine. My nickname is The Rockweiler because of my aggressive, no-holds-bar style of courtroom litigation. And I am fascinated. Anybody who's listened to this podcast or watched this podcast knows I am fascinated with the Robert Durst trial. I've just been fascinated with him. For those of you who know, Robert Durst is a uh, the, the son, I think the second son, a multimillionaire, second son of a real estate tycoon, a real estate magnet in, the, uh, in New York City. They own buildings on, on multiple avenues and streets, uptown, downtown, all over Manhattan. And Robert Durst was the subject of a movie in which Ryan Gosling played him in a movie about his life with his wife, Kathy Durst, who ended up disappearing without a trace. Uh, Robert Durst has been the subject of a TV series, a TV series and even a, a docu entertainment, some kind of documentary called The, the, uh, the Jinx, which, was, which appeared on HBO. Robert Durst is the suspect in the uh, disappearance and presumed death and murder of his wife, Kathy. He was accused and acquitted, stood trial and was acquitted in Galveston, Texas, for the murder and dismemberment of a flatmate of his named Morris Black. And he's standing trial in um, in L.A., in Los Angeles County, um, for the murder of Susan Berman, one of his dear friends. And the backdrop to all of this is basically that he has spent a lifetime trying to cover up or sort of eliminate witnesses or people who may have been able to um, uh, aid in uh, proving that he killed or participated in the killing uh, of his wife, Kathy. It's fascinating. Some of the very best lawyers are litigating this case. I mean, these guys are legends, legends. And I keep going back to this trial because um, I've watched it periodically here and there. And I want to spend just a, a bit of time talking about an extremely unusual segment related to the, 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 the attempt by the prosecution, uh, who's led by a guy named John Lewin to call Doug Oliver, Douglas Oliver, who is a longtime friend of Robert Durst. And the prosecution in this trial calls Douglas Oliver as a witness and chaos ensues. Now, when I mean chaos, I don't mean like Maury Povich, that kind of, you know, Geraldo chairs throwing. But absent the chairs, without the chairs being thrown, without the, the bodyguards coming up and holding people back without that type of drama, this case, this, this, this event, this exchange between the prosecutor and Douglas Oliver has just about um, um, as much courtroom drama as you can imagine. Let me set the stage for you, because this is one of the most unusual examinations by a prosecutor or by a lawyer of a witness that I have seen in all of my years. So I want to set the table. They called Douglas Oliver. Apparently, Oliver had been resistant um, over the course of time to uh, participate in the, the prosecution to the point that the judge in the case issued a search for, or issued a, a body attachment. In other words, issued a warrant for Oliver's appearance in court. It's fascinating. And what the prosecutor does in this case is he sort of, he, by agreement, he calls Douglas Oliver. So Oliver appears. He's got his lawyer over in the corner. Oliver appears. Durst is sitting there in a wheelchair. Uh, he's got um, Doug, he's got Oliver on the witness stand. And within a very few short minutes of uh, attempting to establish an examination of Oliver, he, the prosecutor, John Lewin, begins to ask moves to have him declared as a hostile witness, and then begins the process of basically attempting to impeach uh, Doug Oliver, this witness, 
without ever presenting any substantive testimony. Now, as most of you know, the way impeachment, and it's, and it's very clever, and it's certainly unorthodox. So, and it ends up being effective. The question is, how many judges would allow a, uh, a lawyer to begin the process of impeachment before there's any substance developed? So here's sort of what's happening. The prosecution wants to, the typical way that a, a, a the typical way that a lawyer would conduct impeachment of a witness is to attempt to draw out some facts. And then when the witness um, um, go deviates, hesitates, shows bias, interest, motive on the witness stand, the, pro the, the lawyer would then begin the process of establishing impeachment and would then impeach the witness by showing that he's uncooperative, hostile, difficult, unwilling to um, you know, evasive, evading the, the lawyers, evading the witnesses. And there's a certain way to do it. Now, what's happening in this case, though, is that the, the prosecution really makes no effort, no effort whatsoever to attempt to establish any substantive testimony to then impeach um, uh, Mr. Oliver. So what I'm going to do if I'm capable of doing it here, is to play a portion of the trial and I'm gonna play it and I'm gonna um, play some of it, point some things out, and then encourage you all to tell me what you think about the propriety, the fairness of impeaching a witness in this way. And some of the reasons why I think this is so important is because the, when the witness is, is examined, at times, the defense keeps challenging the propriety of doing this. And at one point, the judge even says, you know, I'm going to let the prosecutor do it, because if I don't let Mr. Lewin do it, he'll just stand here and he will object. He'll then make an offer of proof and he'll tell us and the jury all of the reasons why he should be allowed to do it before we get any information from the witness. In other words, the judge's essentially saying, I'm going to let the prosecutor do it because he's going to bully me if I don't. At least that's my take on it. Let's watch. This is Robert Durst. He's not looking too well. Daughter married for? Uh -oh. Uh, less than seven years. This is and dug you out. you had a child yourself together, is that correct? You and your ex-wife? Yes. So during the time that you knew Mr. Hirschfeld, did you become involved yourself in real estate? I was involved in real estate before I met Mr. Hirschfeld. Do you recall previously stating, Mr. Oliver, that you married your ex-wife, Rachel, in 1973? I don't recall me making that statement. Okay, this is going uh, to be pleasant. Uh, you hear the prosecutor there saying, okay, this is going to be pleasant. What's the next answer? When did you marry your wife, Rachel? In 1973. And in 1975, did you believe that you had made enough money and you didn't have to work again? No. Do you recall saying to me during a recorded interview on October 30th, 2019, that in 1975, you thought you had made enough money and did not have to work again, and you moved to Paris, but you ran out of money and came back to New York. Do you recall saying that? No, I do not. Is that true or false? Is it what true or false? Is the statement, Mr. Oliver, I, I was going to wait a little while, Your Honor, but, 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 but really... Oh, really? So, Your Honor, at this point in time, uh, pursuant to the motion that the people previously filed, under Evidence Code Section 767, as well as the Williams case at 43 Cal 4th, 584 at 631, the Spain case, SPAIN 1984 at 154 Cal 3rd at 845, uh, 853, that. citing Goldenson, an 1888 case. You don't get to do that every day. Oh, Goldenson. <laughs> 
Um, Mr. Guerin might have argued that case. I'm not sure. Um, Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be designated as, as an adverse witness. So, uh, uh, yes, granted. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. <clears throat> so the prosecutor has just gotten the judge to agree to declare Doug Oliver, a witness that he called a hostile witness. Now the fun begins. Mr. Oliver, are you denying that you stated during the interview on October 30th, 2019, that by 1975, you thought you'd made enough money, you didn't have to work again, so you moved to Paris to run out of money and move back to New York? I'm not denying it. I, I just don't recall ever saying that. So well, what I asked you is, is that a true statement, yes or no? A true statement. I mean, why I moved to Paris? Okay, so, again, I'm going to take this in parts. I'm, I'm having trouble understanding. Okay, I'll question. take it in parts. In 1975, did you believe that you had made enough money and you didn't have to work again? No. Did you previously state that? I don't recall stating that. So if you had stated it, it would be incorrect, then. Is that what you're saying? Incorrect that I didn't understand it? I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused what you're trying to okay. get at, sir. Well, so, Mr. Oller, if you can, instead of worrying about what you think I'm trying to do, if you can just answer my questions, it'll go a lot faster. I, I am, sir. Objected um, to that remark. No, no, no uh, rule. Uh, but uh, I will uh, suggest that <clears throat> that each that each uh, question <laughs> the judge is now going to give the prosecutor a tip on how to more effectively cross-examine this witness by encouraging him to in each question be very specific and ask only one fact question only elicit one single fact see the judge's hands right there watch this be ex be minute in other words the small just identify one fact and present that fact since you're leading that's what i will do your honor okay for affirmation or, or not at one point in time sure judge thank you for the tip i'll do it that way you moved to paris is that correct yes and while in paris you ran out of money is that correct no did you previously state that you ran out of money while you were i in do paris? not recall stating that I'm sorry? I do yes, not Mr. recall Relevance. that. Objection, relevant. A rule. A rule. I, it's, it's foundational material about this, uh, this uh, witness. About running out of money in Paris? <clears throat> I, I'm not going to call upon Mr. Lewin now to describe the, the, the uh, scenario under which this will become relevant. I'm going to give him some leeway. Otherwise, Mr. Lewin will be stating his case so that he should be eliciting uh, from the witness. So I am going to give him leeway. You may proceed. Would you agree, Mr. Hey, did you just see that? Did you see that? No. Did you? So I'm going to replay it. So the defense actually objects. And the judge says overruled. But he says, I'm not going to encourage Mr. Lewin, the prosecutor, to give an offer of proof. Because if I do... He'll just stand here and tell everybody in open court what he's what the rationale and how these are all connected together. And 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 then what he should be getting that from the witness. In other words, the judge is concerned that even if he says overruled, the prosecutor will then stand there and and make this presentation basically a mini, mini microcosm of a closing argument. And the jury will hear it anyway. And that's the reason why the judge overrules it. And then he says, well, I'll strike it later, except the bell's already rung. If he gets this out and later on it gets stricken, what value is that? The jury's already heard all of it. Previously state that. I don't recall stating that. So if you had stated it, it would be incorrect. And is that what you're saying? Incorrect that I didn't understand it? I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused what you're trying to okay. get at, sir. Well, so Mr. Aller, if you can, Instead of worrying about what you think I'm trying to do, if you could just answer my questions, it'll go a lot faster. I, I am, sir. Um, to that remark. No, no, no rule. Uh, but uh, I will uh, suggest that <clears throat> that each that each uh, question be ex be minute. 
In other words, the small, just identify one fact and present that fact since you're leading. That's what I will do, Your Honor. Okay, for affirmation or, or not. At one point in time, you <clears throat> moved to Paris, is that correct? Yes. And while in Paris, you ran out of money, is that correct? No. Did you previously state that you ran out of money while you were in Paris? I do not recall stating it. I'm sorry? I do yes, not recall relevance. that. Objection, relevance. A rule. A rule. I, it's this foundational material about this, uh, this uh, witness. Foundational to what? What's it foundational to? <laughs> I didn't listen to a single substance effect. What's it foundational to? Whether he ran out of money in Paris or said he did? Ran out of money in Paris? <clears throat> I, I'm not going to call upon Mr. Lewin now to describe the, the, the uh, scenario under which this will become relevant. I'm going to give him some leeway. Otherwise, Mr. Lewin will be stating his case so that he should be uh, listening from the witness. So I am going to give him leeway. You may proceed. Would you agree, Mr. <laughs> Oliver, that Robert Durst is somebody you care very much about? Yes. Do you consider yourself in the courtroom today to be a neutral, unbiased witness? Yes. Are you here just to answer our questions and to tell us what you know? That's what I'm supposed to do, correct? Again, if you can answer my question. Yeah, I'm here to answer the questions, yes, of course. Is it fair to say, Mr. Oliver, that you did not want to come to court? No. That's not a fair thing to say. No. Is it fair to say that you have been uncooperative with nearly every attempt to contact you since Mr. Durst was arrested in 2015? I'm here. I have, I'm very cooperative. So listen to my question. Have you been cooperative throughout the investigation since 2015? I believe so. You believe, okay. Um, you have an attorney, is that correct, Mr. Oliver? Yes. And you were ordered, in fact, you were ordered by Judge Wyndham to be in court and have been on call, having no choice to come or not to come to court. Is that correct? I'm, I'm in court, sir. So, Mr. Oliver, if you can, I want you to listen to my question very carefully. You were ordered by Judge Wyndham to be on call to me in my office. Is that correct? To the best of my recollection, yes. And in fact, you got a lawyer, is that correct, who has been dealing with us regarding figuring out the time for you to come to court. Is that correct? Correct. Now, with respect to getting that lawyer, you or your lawyer requested the transcripts of your prior interviews. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure if, if she did. Well, let me ask this. Have you had, have you, do you have in your possession or have you listened to the prior interviews that you've given in this case that were recorded? I've seen um, some transcripts of, of some of the um, conversations, yes. If you can, again, maybe it's my bad hearing. Your Honor, could the court inquire of the jury if they can hear him? I can't very well. Okay, you, you, please uh, raise your voice. Is this better? Yes. Okay, sorry. Okay. So I want to go back to 1982. Were you contacted or interviewed at all by New York Police Department investigators in 1982 at the time that Kathy Durst disappeared? In 1982? Yes. Uh, I'm, I believe so, yes. You believe you were interviewed at that time? Yes, you've told me several times. H have you? Do you know who interviewed you? No. Have you ever told us or been provided with an interview of what you allegedly said back in 1982? I've never seen, you mean like a transcript or? So what I'm asking you is, and let me say it this way, what makes you believe you were interviewed in 1982? Do you have an I mean, this is like shooting fish in a barrel and they haven't even gotten to one substantive question yet. Actual memory of that? Actually, I don't have a memory of it. Okay, so you don't know whether you were interviewed in 1982 no, or not? No, I believe I was interviewed. Uh, you've told me I was interviewed. 2001, correct? Mr. Oliver's when you were interviewed first. Is that correct? 
You know, I, the best of my recollection, I can't remember. Did you ever yourself reach out to investigators at the time that Kathy Durst disappeared? I do not believe I ever reached out to anyone. Any reason why not? No. Maybe objection, relevance, irrelevant. He has no duty to reach out. Maybe he didn't know anything. And again, the, the prosecutor asked the question, and the, why didn't you reach out? And of course, the insinuation is what? That he knew something and chose not to? That he had some information and chose not to share it? That he was covering for his, his, uh, his friend, Robert Durst? You knew at some point that she was missing, correct? Correct. And you and Bob Durst were very close friends back in 1982, is that correct? Yes. And did you believe that potentially, Mr. Oliver, strike that, you knew that you had spoken to Mr. Durst the week after his wife allegedly disappeared, correct? I don't recall that. So you do remember being contacted by investigators from the New York State Police in 2001, is that right? Well, first of all, I, I'm not sure if it was in New York State Police. I'm not sure which police department. Counsel, will you stipulate, it will save us a little bit of time, that Mr. Oliver was interviewed on December 19, 2001 by New York State Police? I don't know that. Yeah. What's that? There's no stipulation. Okay. We'll do it the long way. Do you? They've not stipulated to that fact, so Mr. Lewin will be inquiring of you. You'll, he'll just, you'll answer questions about that. Okay. Sure. Do you talk, into the, talk loud into that? I, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Do you recall, Mr. Oliver, being interviewed in Westchester County by investigators who were either from the New York State Police or the Westchester County District Attorney's Office? I do not recall that. And in saying that you do not recall it, then I assume you don't have any memory of what you would have said to them. Is that correct? At the best of my knowledge, I can't remember what I said to them. Well, you've been asked before by me about this interview in 2001, correct? I don't recall that. So you don't remember during our 2019 interview, you being asked about what you had said to investigators in 2001. You have no memory of that? At the best of my recollection, I cannot remember anything. Let me see if this helps. Do you recall, Mr. Oliver? Now, the witness has just said multiple times, I don't remember the conversation. I don't recall the conversation. I don't recall. He's given him specific facts. And the witness has said, I don't recall. So the prosecutor, instead of, because he went to the, to the overall question and said, overall, he asked, do you remember? That should be pretty close to the end of the inquiry. Instead, perhaps he should have started with the specific facts and asked specific facts. Did you say, did you say, do you remember saying this? Do you remember saying that? And if the witness denies it or the witness ends up saying, I don't recall or I don't remember saying that, then you can take steps back and say, so you don't recall the, any of the interview. But he's already asked sort of the ultimate question of this witness, which is, do you remember this interview? And now the witness says, no, I don't. Now what the prosecutor is going to do is attempt to introduce a fact from that interview, which is highly prejudicial, and see if this witness, if that sparks the witness's memory. Uh, there is, I have to say, um, when you listen to it and you hear it, it, this is done, in my opinion, backwards. And when this prosecutor is about to ask this very incendiary question, very incendiary question, well, let me see if this helps you remember. And then he's going to introduce a specific fact, an incendiary, um, a prejudicial, inflammatory fact that will, whether the witness affirms it or denies it or says, I still don't remember, this witness is going to be in a position of he will look absolutely destroyed. He will look like such a bad guy. And by proxy, so will the accused. Watch this. Saying to detectives in 2001, 
that you believe that Kathy Durst might have been sold into white slavery because of her cocaine problem. Do you recall saying that? I do not recall that. Okay. Do you see what just happened? The prosecutor asked the general question multiple times. You remember the interview? Do you remember the interview? Do you remember what you said? Remember anything about what you said? The witness is, is concretely said no. Now the prosecutor goes back and he actually wants to now ask specific questions about an interview that the witness has just said that he doesn't recall. And not just do you remember anything that you said, which he's already denied. Now he wants to ask a specific question about a specific incendiary fact about that. Didn't do you remember saying that you believe that Kathy Durst had been sold into slavery? It's one of those. When is the last time that you when did you stop you know, beating your wife or when did you stop abusing your child? Because the, 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 the taint is in the air. I mean, the taint is just in the air. Even if the witness says, I don't recall that. I don't believe I said that. Uh, he's already said multiple times that he doesn't recall. But now there's no answer he can give to this question. No answer he can give to this question that will in any way be able to preserve his integrity or credibility on the stand. And the prosecutor knows it. I think that the, the prosecutor should have led with this question say, didn't you say this? Didn't you say that? And then when the witness denies it or says he doesn't remember, then either show him the transcript or say, or show him a report, see if that refreshes your recollection or impeach him with it. And then backwards and say, so you don't remember anything from this interview. That's the much cleaner way to do it. This way is really just throwing the, 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 the poison in the well. Is, is that a document you're referring to? Yeah, it's my document. May, may I see that? No, <laughs> you may not. Do, do you do you recall, Mr. Oliver? Recall what? Do you recall making that comment that you believed that Kathy Durst had been sold into white slavery because of her cocaine problem? I, I do. The What's best that? To my recollection, I cannot recall that. Do you recall being asked about this during the 2019 interview with me and responding? Oh wait. He's just said he doesn't recall the interview. He doesn't recall any of the content. He's been asked a specific question saying he doesn't recall making the statement. And now the prosecutor is being asked to say, OK, well, do you recall in an interview with me answering questions about that comment? That, quote, Bob Durst didn't tell you that you were probably, quote, just being funny when you said it. Do you recall saying that? I do not recall that. And as you sit here today, that whole thing is objectionable. It's now in front of the jury. Nobody's objected. It's all objectionable. All of it. He's just attempting to add now details in front of the jury. The witness has denied it. And then he got to add another line of questions about it in which he, the prosecutor, played the, the role of question. Are you telling me that the first time you can ever recall the subject of Kathy Durst being sold into white slavery is during this examination today? I don't remember if I said that or not. Well, let me ask you, do you think if you would have said it, you would have remembered it? Here comes a hypothetical. Hypothetical based upon lack of memory and speculation in a hypothetical. Do you think that if you had said it, that you would have had a reason for saying it. There are so many layers in that question that are, are objectionable. I can't, I don't know how to answer that. Well, does the concept, I Mr. Oliver, of Kathy Durst being sold into white slavery, does that sound like something that you could have thought? No. Now, I will say this, that this happens to be Pretty brilliant cross-examination if you're able to get away with it as the prosecutor is. And if the rules in California or the rules elsewhere or a judge allows you to do this, it's pretty ingenious because he's just battering this guy. This guy's credibility is destroyed from the start. I mean, the jury is going to presume that this man made that statement. They're going to presume that he made the statement in 2001. They're going to presume that he was asked about it in 2019. And they're going to think that there's no way that he could have possibly forgotten this statement. And remember, at all now the prosecutor is even being allowed to ask hypotheticals about it. And unbelievably, there's not been one 
bit of substance that has been asked of this witness. I would never have thought of that, I don't believe. So I want you to assume for a moment. In now comes the hypothetical. It's hypothetical that you made that comment. Can you explain why you would have said that? So uh, he wants to ask the witness a hypothetical, assuming that he said a statement that he says he doesn't recall, assume that you made the statement that you don't recall, and tell us why you would have said it. Dizzying. That's assuming something he said he doesn't remember. Objection. False. Uh, uh, false. Okay. false statement. Okay. False statement. No, is not not, about sorry. Objection. I'm sorry. My mouth got stuck in my <laughs> okay. mask. Okay. Unstick your mouth and make a valid objection. <laughs> it's a hypothetical, not based on a valid basis. Okay. What you are now? The judge sustains the objection. Watch this. Close enough. It is the same. Your, your Honor, yes. as an offer of proof, detective no, no, no. will be coming in to testify to that statement. I object to the offer of proof. If I counsel have this is a speaking on. objection, and I object to it. Okay, everybody, inhale. Okay. We Remember the Judge Ito, inhale, take five seconds and catch our breaths. It seems that the judge in this case is taking a page from his colleagues taking a page from his, uh, his colleague's approach to uh, getting lawyers in the courtroom to calm down. Take a break now. <laughs> Exhale. That's okay. Our break will be quite brief. Pause. The objection was sustained. The, process, the defense lawyer, Dick DeGuerin, had to turn to Lewin and say, sustained. Lewin then argues over the top of DeGuerin. The judge hears the two of them. Lewin starts to give his his uh, um, <laughs> his offer of proof. The prosecutor, the defense lawyer, objects and says, "Speaking objection." The judge says, "Inhale, relax, and watch this." I think I need to meditate on that. <laughs> you do. You do. All right. Would you like the bait stamp discovery page where this statement is indicated, Your Honor? Okay, no, no. I... Now, what Lewin is doing is he's trying to, to, to ask, he's trying to throw in there that there are pages referenced, that there are bait stamps, which are, are numbers in the bottom of pages that will actually show whomever's reading the page. And it will show that this is, he's not making it up. And so what he's doing is, He's trying to make it seem like by making a comment that the defense has all the discovery and trying to make a comment that to Garen that there are bait stamps. He's trying to let the jury and the judge know that he's not making it up. He's trying to bolster his credibility and he's trying to diminish the, the credibility of the defense and force the judge to uh, uh, reverse his ruling. I, I know you're you're so <clears throat> you intend to uh, supply this factual uh basis foundational to impeachment subject yeah. to 1235 of the evidence code of people right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what's coming if hypothetically you said it why would you Getting say you're overruled okay objections overruled objections overruled now wait sustained he thinks about it reads it <laughs> to Garen's like, what? Watch the Garen pop up. Sorry. I'm, I thought you I'm over the objection. Pardon? I thought you should. I, I did, but I've rethought it. I'm going to overrule it. Mr. Lewin says he's going to supply the factual basis for it. In other words, it's it's not assuming a fact that won't be won't be proved. I'll strike it if if that fact is not supplied. I think I know what he's. So as a cross examiner, this is like incredible leeway. I mean, I will say. I have anybody that's watched, I've given Lewin um, um, credit for this approach. It's a very clever approach to cross examination. He has the judge essentially afraid or concerned that Lewin is going to make speaking objections. He's got himself reversing rulings when he makes rulings in favor of the defense. And Lewin is basically going to be allowed to put all this evidence in subject to him tying it up later. And if he doesn't tie it up later, then the defense will ask the judge to strike it. But it will have been settled, cemented, bolted to the ground, 
and stuck in the jury's memory for the rest of the trial. Supply and it's bootstrapping. He's supplying his own uh, basis for it. But well, it's their writing. It's not just the witnesses' writing. We'll see. Well, that... I, I have to give Lewin credit. As a lawyer, as a cross examiner, of course you want to be aggressive. You have to read the room. And one of the things you have to know is are you able to support the the objections you're making? Are you able to support the, the cross-examination questions that you're putting forward? Are you able to do it in a way that the judge approves? Are you able to do it? Does the judge seem to be um, um, uh, responding well, or at least responding permissively to your efforts? And in this case, there's no question that the judge is, is letting Mr. Lewin sort of, um, you know, conduct this cross examine the way he wants. And, and this cross examination, if you have the opportunity to watch the rest of it, is destructive to this witness's credibility. It is absolutely destructive. Mind you, not one single piece of, of substantive evidence has been elicited. All that's been elicited so far from this witness is basically that he has been uh, generally uncooperative in that he um, made uh, or what he's accused of making a statement about Kathy Durst being sold into slavery as an explanation for her disappearance uh, and yet one that he doesn't recall making, but he's now going to be questioned about it as though the statement were true. It is a fascinating exchange. Fascinating. And what continues is some of the very best setup the very best setup, the very best use of the courtroom, the awareness of the courtroom, the awareness of the, the, the judge, the awareness of the rules of evidence, the awareness of the witness. And it's clear Lewin, uh, who I'm not particularly a, a fan of his sort of over the top sort of bullying style, but he's absolutely hitting all the buttons. And he is, whether you want to say he's getting away with this or not, um, he is painting a, a picture and will paint a picture that this witness is absolutely um, incredible. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah. So listen to my question, Mr. <clears throat> Oliver. I want you to assume for the purposes of this hypothetical. I want you to assume for purposes of this hypothetical. That you made a statement. That you made a statement. To New York State investigators on December 19th, 2001, that said that you believed that Kathy might have been sold into white slavery because of her cocaine problem. So I'm now asking you to assume you said that. So assume you said that statement, even though the witness has said he doesn't recall, doesn't recall the interview, doesn't recall the statement. My question is, can you explain why you would have said that? I now want you to assume a statement. Assume this awful statement was made by you, even though you've said that you don't recall making it. And now I want you to, assuming that you made it, tell me why you would have made it. Again, that's assuming no, no, that it said it. Oh, no, no, over overruled, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna strike it unless, uh, I'm gonna have you introduce the inconsistent statement. Okay. Well, well, but after you ask the hypothetical about why, and then I'll- Your Honor, that's gonna come through, uh, a, a witness is going to testify. I can give the court all the authority, but that witness- So the judge is gonna let this in. And this is now going to be a door when the witness answers this question that's going to open the door to even more impeachment on top of this hypothetical about a question, about a statement that the witness himself doesn't recall making. Going to be coming out and testifying. Speaking objection. No, no, no it's a, he's, he's, a, he's a quick. Council has the discovery, Your Honor. We, the, it's not a dispute. It's what was. Council has the discovery. It's not a dispute. It's a way to make the Garen look like he's just playing the. The, the mouthpiece and playing sort of the sleazy lawyer, uh, basically saying that how can he say the implication of the jury is how could he say that he doesn't know about this information because he has it in the discovery. It's basically making trying to, to demean, uh, although and, and, and diminish DeGaren's credibility. Yeah. Okay. 
I'll strike it if it's not supplied, if the factual basis isn't supplied, if uh, counsel has a different way to introduce that fact other than introduction through this own this witness of this. I mean, you could publish the inconsistency. I'll strike it, the judge says, later, after the, it's already settled in the jury's mind, and this witness has had to now battle with Lewin over after he claimed he didn't recall, didn't recall the statement, didn't recall the specific the interview, didn't recall the specific statement, and now is being asked a hypothetical to assume he said it, and now being asked to explain why you said something that you don't have any recollection of saying. Statement now, if you wished, or uh, but I'll strike it unless you publish it one way or another. Thank you, Your Honor. Did you understand my question, Mr. Oliver? Not really. Okay, so. I'm having you assume that you made that statement to detectives. So I'm just trying to understand why you would have said, if you have any idea, why you would have told them that you believe that Kathy Durst might have been sold into white slavery because of a cocaine problem. I, I don't believe I ever told them. Okay. Now, this is what all of this, all of this, the permissiveness that the judge gave the Lewin, which is brilliant, by the way, if Lewin can, can, can pull this off, this is brilliant cross-examination because he's now just with, despite the lack of memory, despite the lack of memory, the, and a hypothetical to assume he said it, he's now denied saying or said, I don't believe that I said it. And now Lewin gets to impeach him with that denial. So you're denying. So, so here's what I'm asking. I want you to assume for a moment that you said that. I'm asking you to assume you said it. Would it be your testimony then that you would not be able to explain why you would have said that? No, I can't. Wait a minute. Objection. Uh, as to a hypothetical question, he's the witness has uh, denies. He deny. He denies yes. saying it. So why would you say something and he denies saying it? So it <laughs> appears nonsensical in, in a way. It, yes. On the other hand, if the... But that's if, my objection, yeah. nonsensical. Nonsensical. All I don't right. think Thank that's, you for that's not an objection. No, 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 no. I, and I understand. The, the objection is that it's an improper hypothetical, and I've overruled that objection. Okay. So, let's continue. Subject to a motion to strike, uh, for, for reasons I explained. Mr. <clears throat> Oliver, you were not contacted by any law enforcement relating to... Ah, oh, dizzying. I have to say that the examination of Doug Lewin, excuse me, of Douglas Oliver by John Lewin gets worse and worse and worse for Lewin. Worse. It gets worse. I mean, at this point, regardless of what, and I'm curious what anybody watching this thinks about this exchange, but I'll say this. It would be almost impossible now for Lewin to for for Oliver to come back and be a remotely credible or impactful witness. The jury has just heard this man deny making a statement or saying he doesn't recall that he doesn't recall the interview, doesn't recall the statement. He's pitted him. Lewin is, I think, very masterfully pitted himself against the 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 process, the, the witness and the defense and saying, I asked you about this. Don't you remember that? He, of course, says, I don't recall that. The judge is basically letting him ask this hypothetical. Do you assume you said something that you don't recall saying? Why did you say it? Then ultimately, he says, I have no explanation for why I would have said something that you're asking me to assume I said that I don't recall saying. It makes the witness look, because remember, the, the, the fact that the, the witnesses, that the jury is hearing, the fact that they now have heard multiple times is that this statement that he made a comment about his friend's wife's disappearance and said maybe she was sold into white slavery is an offensive, demeaning, prejudicial, inflammatory, salacious comment. It's not even a, a remotely funny joke. If it was a joke, it was done in bad taste. But that comment is now stuck right here, stapled to that witness's chest. That's all the jury is going to be sitting there thinking about is, 
this guy made that comment and he's denying it. And they're going to think that he's lying or being evasive about whether he made the statement and the statement hasn't even been proved yet. Unbelievable. And Lewin's examination of Douglas Oliver continues in this way and continues and continues. And I hope to get a chance to talk to you more about it, because what you're going to see is that if you are able to craft and put together a cross-examination that establishes the witness's bias, hostility, uncooperativeness, before you even get to the substance, what you realize is that when that witness, when you ultimately choose to ask that witness, and here's the setup, you ultimately choose to ask that witness or that witness is asked some, some fact questions and tries to offer some facts to help the defendant or offers facts favorable to the defendant, even if he's not trying to be helpful, think about what the, what the jury's thinking. There has already been the table, the, the, the witness's favorable testimony or helpful testimony to the accused has already been, been set above or a set above a, a pool of quicksand. Whatever the witness says at this point, is the sky blue? Remember, the prosecutor's going to go, is the sky blue? And he says, yes, it's blue. They're going to say, that's the guy you ought to go check. He didn't remember making the statement, didn't remember that comment. He argued with me. He was evasive with me. He had to be reminded. I had to ask him a hypothetical. And even then, he said he didn't recall making that statement. Y'all better go outside and check if the sky's blue. You can't take that guy's word for even that. Lewin was able to destroy this witness's credibility before a single question was asked of him substantively. While I'm not going to comment on all, everything, I'm just going to say that this happens to be a very, very, very unique way, a very clever, crafty, unique way to attempt to conduct an impeachment of a potentially, of a witness who's potentially helpful to the other side. And it's definitely worth watching for those out there that are interested in cross-examination styles, because if you can figure out a way to duplicate this using the rules of evidence, then you can undermine the credibility of a witness before that witness even says anything substantively. What a, a powerful tool if you are, in fact, the, the, the cross-examiner. So this is Neil Rockine. Welcome to our thank you, I should say, for tuning in to another, uh, although abbreviated edition of Killer Cross-Examination. Um, we've got tons of great comment, tons of great new interviews coming out. And uh, I'm just I'll probably keep going back to this Durst trial from time to time again, because I'm just fascinated by the lawyer. I'm just fascinated by the courtroom dynamics. Anyway, this is Neil Rockine. Visit our site, killercrossexamination.com. Visit all of our social media pages. Comment on YouTube where you can watch me dissect this trial uh, and portions of this trial. And let me know what you think. What do you think about the way that, that Lewin is conducting this examination? What do you think about the way the judge is letting Lewin go? What do you think about... The, the way that Lewin has set this cross-examination up without any substantive evidence and basically being permitted to ask hypothetical questions to the witness about statements that the witness doesn't remember making. Brilliant, incredible stuff. I'll see you soon.